When you think about loyalist space marines in the 40k setting, you probably conjure up images of a bright and gleaming ultramarine enforcing the imperial creed, or maybe a heroic and strong salamander cleansing a planet with holy fire. And I often see people talking about how modern 40k seems to be trying to make the loyalist forces of the imperium look more and more like what we would consider to be classic good guys. With cleaner space marine designs and even a range of children's books which focus on the the Imperium of Mankind as its protagonist. But I disagree, and also I like those kids books, I think they're cool. In my opinion, Warhammer 40k is still a very spooky and often mysterious horror setting. So in this video I'm going to be sharing with you my personal favourite Space Marine chapters, which prove without a shadow of a doubt that just because a chapter is considered to be loyal doesn't mean they can't also be haunted, bloodthirsty, secretive, and at their core just deeply terrifying. Whoosh. Our first insight into the darker side of Loyalist Space Marines is going to be The Exorcists, a menacing dark red Space Marine chapter born of the hardy gene seed of Rogel Dorn of the Imperial Fists, though their true lineage is often regarded as a mystery. This chapter hails from the feral homeworld of Banish, and you know we're already off to a fun start with a name like that, but actually Banish is quite a fitting name for this chapter's home planet, because if the forces of the Imperium and the Ecclesiarchy knew the true nature of this chapter, then they would surely be deemed heretics and deleted from all Imperial records. Because hidden away on their home planet, the exorcists have a hidden purpose, which is that of being very specifically demon hunters. And in the case of the exorcists, this comes with a very heavy emphasis on the tactic knowing your enemy. Because the way in which this chapter is chosen to harden themselves against the ruinous powers of the warp is to allow themselves to be temporary possessed by demons. The means by which the exorcists perform this initiation are shrouded in secrecy, however the way it essentially works is that a young neophyte will, for a short period of time, become the bodily host of a demon before it is eventually banished from his body. And unfortunately this process often doesn't go according to plan, in fact to outsiders it seems absolutely perplexing that the vast majority of initiate hopefuls perish before ever getting a chance to join the ranks of the exorcists. And though those who do end up making it through this horrifying initiation do not come out the other side unchanged or unmarked. Even the most resilient exorcist initiates who emerge from the halls of tempering carry physical and mental stigmata for life. The exact nature of these wounds can vary as widely as the nature of the demons themselves, with each warp entity leaving its own uniquely malign imprint. Beneath their power armour, exorcists bear unnatural physical scars and blemishes. Some of these take the shape of fell runes that throb with a dull pain in the presence of warp spawn. Discoloured eyes and patches of scaly flesh are not uncommon, and some survivors even experience spiny growth sprouting from their heads or limbs. I love all of the mystery and the secrecy built into this chapter, but for me one of the most chilling details about the exorcists is their war cry. Other chapters war cries are commonly some variation of for the emperor or something something loyalty something something kill. However the exorcists are said to come onto the battlefield reciting slow and chilling chants in dark languages mixed with litanies in high gothic. Now for another Space Marine chapter who, despite their staunch loyalty to the deceased Primarch Sanguinius, tread dangerously close to falling to darker forces in the galaxy, it is the Angels Resplendent. As you can probably tell from their extremely cool name, this little known company of bright orangey red Space Marines are a successor chapter of the Blood Angels created during the Ninth Founding. And unlike the rough and ready troops of many many other Space Marine factions, the Angels Resplendent prided themselves on being fine artisans. Until something very strange happened and the chapter stumbled upon someone called the Undying Martyr who they proclaimed as their prophet after just 19 days. Now I know what you're thinking here because I thought the same thing, the Undying Martyr must be some kind of very powerful, very influential space marine chaplain. But no, he wasn't, the Undying Martyr 
was just a guy, he was a mortal. The Undying Martyr is described as being unnaturally tall and covered in boils and cuts with a very distinctive aquila hanging from his neck. And what's even more mysterious about the Undying Martyr is that when he arrived on the Angel's Monastery's doorstep, he should have been dead by all accounts he should have died as he had these massive grievous chest wounds, but instead of dying he lived, and he ended up conversing with the Angel's chaplain for many many days. And to cut a long story short, what happened when the Undying Martyr arrived at the monastery is that he decided to impose a very unforgiving version of the Imperial Creed, wherein he had a look at these very fancy artisan space marines and said, you're too fancy, I don't like that, stop it. This whole cultural upheaval ended with something the chapter referred to as the Great Purge, which saw the previously very artisanal chapter fully rejecting, as well as purging, all of their previous artifacts and previous ways of living, even going as far as to change their name from the Angel's Resplendent to the Angel's Penitent. And whilst all of this is very strange, the real reason that this chapter gives me the heebie-jeebies is what became of them after the purge. Because in order to repent for their previous heretical and self-aggrandizing lifestyle, the angels resplendent turned penitent became obsessed with punishing themselves for their sins. And perhaps the most terrifying thing is that prior to the arrival of the Undying Martyr, the chapter had no recorded incidents of any of their battle brothers being affected by the Black Rage. However, after the stranger joined their ranks, the condition now runs rampant and unchecked amongst the chapter. Now for a fan and personal favourite chapter of mine, of course it's everyone's favourite sad boys, the Lamenters. The Lamenters are yet another successor chapter of the Blood Angels to make it onto this list, and they're super popular amongst 40k fans due to their bright colour scheme which has gone mostly unchanged since Rogue Trader times, and their notoriously difficult to paint chapter symbol which again is one of my all time favourites. But the Lamenters bright colour scheme stands in stark contrast with their background and lore because this band of space marines is best known for being the unluckiest chapter in the entire galaxy, causing some to believe that they may be cursed or even haunted. The Lamenters were part of the cursed 21st founding, wherein the Mechanicus opted to try and tinker with the Space Marines gene seed in order to straighten out some of the issues they were having and just ultimately make them more efficient. However, the tech priests may have tinkered a little bit too hard, causing some pretty bad side effects in the Space Marines which were created during this founding, and causing some in the Inquisition to speculate that this cursed founding may be the reason why the Lamenters just can't seem to catch a break. And despite the fact that the Lamenters were genetically modified to not be affected by things like the Red Thirst or the Black Rage, the chapter does suffer from another problem, which is that they all just seem to be really sad all the time. But it feels like a bit of a chicken and egg situation, because if I had been through what the Lamenters have been through, then I reckon I would be pretty sad as well. Their chapter has been nearly fully erased twice, once in the Bad Ab War where their numbers went from 800 plus to bare barely 300, and then again after suffering a gruesome defeat against the Tyranid High Fleet Kraken. Because of all of this misfortune and more, the Lamenters ended up garnering a bit of a reputation for being cursed, and were all but shunned by their fellow Space Marine Legions, despite the fact that they were loyal to the Emperor, and they loved the citizens of the Imperium, and most importantly, they were just doing their best. This shunning even resulted in a highly superstitious chapter known as the Mortifactors, choosing to abandon the Lamenters rather than fight alongside them, leaving them to once again bravely face another battle on their own. And if that sounds like a bit of a dick move, then stick around because it might make a little bit more sense when we talk about the Mortifactors later on in this video. At one point in their history, their numbers dwindled to barely 200 Astartes, and they were considered all but lost until their ship appeared out of the 
warp, having spent a whole century battling the forces that reside there. Eventually, the Lamenter's forces started to grow, and despite their reputation, they even managed to make friends with another fellow misfit chapter, the Astral Claws. Which, again, unfortunately was short-lived as the Astral Claws eventually became the Red Corsairs and sadly turned heretical. The story of the Lamenters and their misfortune is very long, but most of all, it's just really, really sad. But if you enjoy an underdog, painting things that everyone else hates, and 2010's Midwestern emo music, then this is definitely the chapter for you. The Sons of Medusa are a satisfyingly bright green successor chapter of the formidable Iron Hands, and just like their mother legion, they are renowned for their merciless dedication to the Imperial Creed and the God Emperor of Mankind. And also their borderline obsession with replacing their weak human parts with bionic and cybernetic replacements, which in their opinion make for a far superior super soldier. So what could have possibly caused this staunchly loyal band of space marines to nearly become banished and deleted from Imperial records? Well, it's all because of a little thing called the Moiré Schism. The Moiré Schism is a long and complicated period in the Imperium's history, and I'll do my best to simplify it as well as I can here so as not to make this section like 20 minutes long. The Schism was a religious divide which occurred within the Adeptus Mechanicus during the 35th century. And essentially what happened is that a small forge world called Moiré started claiming that there were prophetic patterns held within the fluctuation of the Astronomicon's beacon which could help them tell the future. One of the messages they apparently found declared that one day the churches of Terra and Mars would become one, and the tech priests of Moiré were like, yo, let's team up right now, and everyone else was like, no, we hate that. This schism forced a lot of Mechanicus-friendly space marine factions, such as those within the ranks of the Iron Hands, to essentially have to pick a side, with most of them being against the new tech creed, and around a third of them thinking that it was true and real and should be followed. And the solution they came up with to avoid mass civil war and bloodshed was essentially to banish those in the minority who believed in the strange techno prophecies to the planet of Medusa, and for all of them to make a big promise that no one would kill each other in the meantime. And despite their shameful banishment and their curious belief in the tech priest prophecies, this sect of the Iron Hands sent to Medusa remained loyal to the Emperor and the Imperium and continued to defend it ferociously. They remained so loyal in fact that by the time the civil war had ended and the Imperium had long launched its great cull to detect and eradicate any space marine chapters deemed a bit too heretical. The Sons of Medusa, as they were now known, against all odds ended up passing the test and were once again officially recognised as loyalist Adeptus Astartes. This, however, isn't the end of the Sons of Medusa's mysterious story, as it's said that despite the passage of time and the now strained interpretation of the original visions of Moiré, they still hold their beliefs in the techno foresight, and strange whispers and rumours say that the Primaris marines which bear the gene seed of the Sons of Medusa may indeed have actual prophetic powers. Next up on our list is my personal favourite Space Marine chapter of all time, the Rainbow Warriors. And yes, I know I've done an entire video about Rainbow Warriors before, and their history, and their lore, and why I like them so much, and if you want even more Rainbow Warrior action then you could watch that video now. But I'm still going to put them in this list because I like them, they're my boys and it's my video, and I want to tell you a little bit about why I find them so fun and mysterious. They are one of the original profiles found in Rogue Trader and are cited as being a successor chapter of the Ultramarines. Their colour scheme is bright blue and their heraldry is instantly recognisable for the bright coloured stripes that they have on their power armour. But when you start to look more into their lore, there's a few things about the Rainbow Warriors which doesn't quite add up. First of all, and most obvious, is the fact that the Rainbow Warriors homeworld prism has straight up been redacted with an ominous sounding record deleted on most modern maps of the 40k galaxy. Galaxy. And usually that means trouble, but what happened to the Rainbow Warriors? What did they do to deserve their record deleted? And most importantly, what was their fate? 
The truth is that nobody really knows for sure. However, there are some hints in Rogue Trader for those who look closely enough. Here we see a sister of battle mercilessly gunning down a space marine which looks an awful lot like a rainbow warrior, something which the Adeptus Sororitas aren't typically known to do to the loyal chapters of Rabute Gilliman. Along with that, the Rainbow Warrior's homeworld prism was rumoured to be one of the many stop-off points for some heretical Thousand Suns forces during their campaign into the farther reaches of the galaxy. The whole story is extremely odd, mysterious and fractured, but in my opinion one of the most interesting things about the chapter is actually their weaponry. It's described as not quite being within the norm for your average loyalist chapter. Their plasma weapons are said to be sun bright and discharge a spectrum of colours, and even stranger are their crystalline power swords which shimmer with the iridescence of an oil slick. The mystery of the Rainbow Warrior is one of my favourite little known gems of Warhammer lore, and if you like playing detective then I really recommend that you join me in diving down the seemingly never ending rabbit hole that is being a Rainbow Warrior fan. Now for a space marine faction who, unlike the Rainbow Warriors, are quite a new addition to the Warhammer canon, the Dark Krakens. The Dark Krakens are a Salamander successor chapter who were part of the Ultima founding which occurred after the unfortunate destruction of Cadia. They have a very distinctive dark black and purple colour scheme with what is in my opinion one of the coolest chapter symbols ever which is just a giant fearsome looking squid monster on the side of their shoulders. Apart from their purple colour scheme which is rare amongst loyalist chapters of space marines, the Dark Krakens are unusual for another reason. Their home planet Nactus is not only perpetually bathed in darkness, but is also pretty much entirely covered by ocean. And a little heads up to all my bros out there that may have thalassophobia, because if you're not a fan of deep oceans and the unspeakable horrors which lurk within them, then this is not going to be a very fun chapter for you. When I first heard about the Dark Krakens, I was instantly taken in by their name and their chapter symbol and their colours and their themes of deep wateriness but I was genuinely surprised to hear that they were a salamander successor chapter. Because salamanders are usually heavily associated with fire and lava and burning and, you know, everything that is the complete opposite of water. But the Dark Krakens do have one thing in common with their mother legion, and that is their love for hunting giant Lovecraftian monstrosities. The Dark Krakens of Nactus have taken to the challenge of only hunting the largest foes on their planet, be that the indescribably large or the impossibly numerous. And not only do they love to hunt these creatures, but they also love to use them post-hunt to decorate their armour. One particular Dark Kraken, Captain Krigeni Lucior, has taken to adorning himself in strange trophies that reflect his home planet's culture. Such as a cape made from sea dragon skin, necklaces made from shark's teeth and squid beaks, and even a helmet modified to accommodate an entire shark's dorsal fin. And one of their lexicanums, or lower ranking librarians, named Parion Urari, has one of the best and most original takes on a space marine that I've ever Ever read. Obviously, given his librarian status, he is a psyker, but he specialises in something called wave calling, which essentially means he has psychic powers which correlate to the ocean. This manifests in Urari having a deep affinity to Nactus's aquatic wildlife and even having the ability to enter the minds of the creatures to control their bodies. His bond with the creatures which inhabit the oceans of Nactus is so strong that he actively shuns any kind of hunting performed by his fellow brothers and, unlike Krigeni, he refuses to adorn himself with any trophies of any hunt. He instead chooses to cover his armour with symbols and images painted in bioluminescent ink which depict creatures he is psychically bonded with. The Dark Krakens are definitely one of my big hobby goals as far as painting and converting, and if you would like me to do an entire video on their chapter in a similar way to how I did the Rainbow Warriors, then let me know in the comments section because I would definitely be up for deep diving into their lore even more. Pun intended.
Now we're gonna round this list off by talking about one of the freakiest loyalist space marine chapters I've ever read about, the Mortifactors. And given these guys are not only loyalists, but a successor chapter of the Ultramarines, you may be thinking like, oh come on, how bad can they be? No. No, these guys are freaks. These guys are freaky, weirdo, little triple freak weirdos. Let me explain. The Mortifactors hail from a cold and perpetually dark feral world called Posul, where the locals have some pretty gruesome customs. Due to the grim and extremely hostile nature of their planet, roaming Posulian tribes will regularly war with each other, and often those battles end in grotesque and ritualistic acts of cannibalism. And since the youths of these tribes end up being rounded up and carted off to become Mortifactor neophytes, it's safe to assume that some habits die hard. The Mortifactors have an unsettling obsession with death and funerary rites, which are often led by the chapter's chaplains, who are recruited from the priests and shamans of the postal people. Before a battle, the Mortifactors are known to perform a ritual where they enter a death-like trance, wherein they believe that they can form a bond and means of communication between themselves and their ancestors and even the god emperor, who the natives of the planet consider to be a great and powerful spirit called the ultimate warrior. After battle, the Mortifactor's ritual practices only get more disturbing, often drinking their opponent's blood, feasting on their flesh, and severing their heads in order to collect the skulls inside. It's hard to imagine any loyalist chapter, let alone a successor chapter of the Ultramarines, being ritualistic shamanic cannibals without somebody stepping in to be like, hey dudes, what you're doing over there isn't quite Codex Astartes approved. Or the whole chapter just eventually calling a spade a spade and falling to the ruinous powers of corn, where things like drinking blood and making a fortress out of skulls is highly encouraged on a day-to-day -day basis. But perhaps their loyalty to the Emperor and the fact that that their culture remains and thrives despite the Imperium's knowledge about its practices is supposed to emphasize to us, the reader, just how dark and terrifying the Imperium of Mankind can truly be. Whew. That was a long video. <laughs> if you've made it this far, I just want to say a massive thank you for watching this entire piece. I worked super hard on it and I feel really happy to be back in this chair doing lore content for YouTube. If you enjoyed this video and you like this format and you'd like me to do more stuff like this where I do more talky things about Warhammer lore, then let me know in the comments section and maybe we could do something like a part two. I don't know. Oh yeah, and one more thing. If you liked any of the Space Marine chapters that I mentioned in this video and you're interested in, I don't know, learning how to paint them up, then come back in a few weeks time because I painted every single chapter on this list in super duper tiny scale and I'm going to show you how I did it. Either way, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and as usual, thank you for being rogues. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Uh, bye bye.